Good day, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Sandra Galea. I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. On behalf of our school, welcome. This event is the second of a series of five events we are hosting throughout 2022. Each of these events focuses on one of the five strategic research directions articulated in our school strategy map. These directions serve as focal points for our work guiding our scholarship, teaching, and practice. Thank you for joining us for being part of this conversation. Thank you too to the many who work to make today happen, particularly the Dean's Office and Communications teams, and to Dr. Greg Wellenius, from whom you'll hear in a second, who has served as the intellectual architect of today's series of events. Today's conversation concerns one of the defining public health issues of our time, climate change. Like a pandemic, climate change reflects a slow burning challenge we did not address as early as we should have. We have already begun to see the effects of climate change in extreme weather events, migration, disruption of communities. All of this has implications for health. Creating a healthier future means mitigating the near-term effects of climate change while working to pre prevent the worst of this threat. We are pleased today to welcome expert speakers who will guide our thoughts as we engage with this issue. Today's event will be divided into three sessions, each freestanding. Our first session will be a keynote address on the government perspective on climate change. Moderating our first session is Dr. Greg Wallenius, a professor in our Department of Environmental Health. In this role, Dr. Wallenius leverages his training in epidemiology, environmental health, and human physiology to lead research focusing on assessing the human health impacts of the built environment in the context of rapidly changing climate. Dr. Wallenius's team has made a number of notable contributions to our understanding of the health risks associated with air pollution, noise pollution, and other features of our physical environment and those posed by a change in climate. A key goal of Dr. Wallenius's work is to provide the actionable scientific evidence needed to ensure that our communities are as resilient, sustainable, and healthy as possible, emphasizing the benefits to human health of climate change mitigation and adaptation efforts. Since he's joined our community, Dr. Wallenius has really been a catalyst to a tremendous amount of scholarship and thinking about uh, climate and health. And it's really my pleasure to turn the event over to, to Professor Wallenius, who will introduce and moderate this first panel. Greg, over to you. Thank you, Dean Galea, and thank you to everybody that's joined us today. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with you today, and I'm delighted to introduce our first keynote speaker for today, Dr. John Balbus. Dr. Balbus is the Interim Director of the new Federal Office of Climate Change and Health Equity, which is located within the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. He is a physician and a public health professional with more than 25 years of experience working on the health implications of climate change. Since joining the federal government in 2009, Dr. Balbus has served as principal from the Department of Health and Human Services to the U.S. Global Change Research Program, and he's served as co-chair of the U.S. GCRP's Working Group on Climate Change and Human Health. Prior to his current appointment, Dr. Balbus served as senior advisor for public health to the director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. Dr. Balbus, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you so much for being here today. Great, thank you so much, Greg and, and Dean Galea, and thank you for the honor of being able to open up this, this great conversation. Um, I'm gonna take a, as hopefully a, a few minutes to get you a little bit inside my mind. So, you know, the, the title of today's session is What Can We Do Today? And in this new role that I'm in, uh, that's actually what I wake up every morning with the privilege of being able to ask, but with the, the, you know, the, the mandate to ask what can be done today from an office that has been charged with protecting the health of all American people, especially those most vulnerable, uh, from the health impacts of climate change. How do we prioritize? What do we focus on? Uh, that's what I'm gonna walk you through um, the, the, the thought process that I have um, from this government perspective. I'm gonna share my slides. And um, give you a sense of what we're going to cover. So, Dean Galea alluded to an issue that I'm going to start with, which is we're asking the question what can we do today about climate change, which is a, a phenomenon that's typically defined in terms of decades. Uh, climatologists will, will define climate as as the, the average conditions over a 30 year period. So climate change is, is a change in a 30 year average. And I'll just note that you know, 30, year, 30 years is roughly the half-life of, of a climatologist. So there is an anthropocentric definition to, to what climate is and climate change, um, but it's in the decades range, even though we know, first of all, climate change will be 
manifest with us um, for, for many centuries with, with the changes that we've made to the atmosphere now. Um, public health, on the other hand, really is about you know, alleviating suffering and protecting people's health um, that's occurring right now. There, there's very much of an of a, of a immediate aspect of public health to, to have the data, to see what's going on right in the present, to think about longer term prevention, but a lot of the focus of interventions in public health is, is, is about what's happening and, and, and alleviating the suffering that's before our eyes. So how do we think about that intersection? Uh, I'll, I'll, that's gonna be part of the theme for today. Um, our office is the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity. So I wanna make sure I emphasize how we're thinking about that intersection. It's a very important intersection. And then um, I'm gonna close by giving a little more detail about what we're doing, how we're approaching it, and, and hope that it, it stimulates conversation um, for us and also for the rest of the day today. So let me just start with where we are today. Uh, this is, is a, a map showing the, the, the course of, of one of the more consequential hurricanes of, of, um, of the last season. We know that climate change is warming waters considerably and that warmer water in the Gulf, the warmer water in the Atlantic um, provides more energy to hurricanes. Uh, the changes associated with warmer water and, and warmer atmosphere in general have also tended to, we're um, observing that the hurricanes are slowing which can mean, as, as in the case of Hurricane Harvey, some devastating local flooding as the hurricanes move more slowly. We also know that a, a warmer atmosphere holds more water. And so the amount of rainfall that can fall in a given amount of time has increased markedly over the last couple of decades. So Hurricane Ida um, came in, it, it struck New Orleans uh, as a category two. Um, the impacts locally were were severe and they fell hardest on communities uh, of color, on communities uh, around the New Orleans area, on, on uh, Vietnamese fishermen who lost a lot of their fleet. This is a, a photo of a resilient couple living in mobile uh, and temporary homes uh, who, who actually uh, were able to provide power to, uh, to, to their neighborhood when the power went out in the New Orleans area for, for many weeks. So this is an example of you know, one phenomena, a hurricane that got compounded by loss of physical infrastructure uh, of, of, of electrical power, which then left people vulnerable to the heat that followed. But the most devastating aspect of Hurricane Ida was uh, and the events that happened well after the landfall. So days after landfall, the remnants of the hurricane met up with other uh, atmospheric disturbances and produced torrential, uh, nearly unprecedented rainfall in Northern New Jersey and the New York metropolitan area. Um, and you know, this is showing the, the basement, flooded basements in uh, one of them in, 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 in uh, areas of Brooklyn and areas of, of Northern New Jersey. And the greatest death toll associated with the storm itself came from this flooding uh, of uh, recent, mostly recent immigrants living in basement apartments, nearly all of whom were, were of uh, Asian descent. So we see a lot of things illustrated here. The, the cumulative stress, the intersection of you know, relatively unprecedented, in this case, climate change fueled severe weather that is being felt and, and suffering uh, being focused in communities that are experiencing multiple stressors ranging from poverty, racial discrimination, um, difficult work or lack of work. Uh, and in, with all of the intersectionality of that in general, bearing a higher proportion of, of chronic, uh, chronic diseases, such as asthma, hypertension, diabetes, anxiety, depression, that then make them more vulnerable when an additional stressor comes in. I would just point out also, uh, we're gonna hear uh, later today from, from Dr. Domenici uh, that she recently just published this, uh, a paper in JAMA Network that demonstrates that hurricanes like this, and I'm focusing on the acute uh, impacts that happen you know, from, from the injuries, from the loss of power, from the flooding that happens, that's, that's a lot of the immediate death toll, but she's documented the 
the lagged effects on, on mortality uh, in a Medicare population from a lot of different causes, infectious diseases, cardiovascular disease that, that actually are significant out one to two months after the event. So very important that hurricanes have you know, in vulnerable populations in the elderly and people with chronic conditions, both an acute and a very important chronic phase that hasn't been recognized as well. Last year, we saw some other phenomena that are manifestations of a changing climate in the here and now. Uh, the, one of the most devastating was the heat dome that, uh, as it says here, completely shattered the records. Uh, the, the climatologists who studied this gave it nearly 100% uh, attributability to the increase in energy, the increase in, in um, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that has occurred so far that this would not have happened without the climate change that has occurred. Um, we know that hundreds of people lost their lives um, uh, from, from heat related illness. And, and that's a tip of the iceberg. Estimates are that it could be five or six times as many people are, are dying from heat exacerbated chronic conditions like heart disease. Uh, we don't yet have the full uh, epidemiology unpacking of this heat wave in the United States, but a, a recent study in Vancouver um, looked at the intersectionality of risk factors that included gender, age, um, indices of, of social and material deprivation, uh, and green cover. And it, it found what might be expected a compounding effect. So um, if you were uh, in, in an age range between 65 and, uh, and 74, actually, I'm sorry, between 74 and 85 was the highest risk. If you experienced both social and material deprivation, if you um, also lived in an area that was dense and had lack of green cover, you had a threefold risk of dying from this heat wave in Vancouver. On the right side is, is a recent analysis that's um, taken a look at the change. This was from, from NPR, uh, uh, did, an al an analysts did this. They looked at, at, at the change in wildfire smoke, comparing this average of wildfire smoke across US counties uh, over the last five years to, to a period that was uh, about eight years prior to that. Uh, and this was striking to me because when we think of wildfires, we think of California, we think of the Northwest, the, the Rockies. Uh, but what this is showing is that wildfire is really, a, uh, smoke is a national phenomenon. Uh, even here in Washington, DC, during the wildfires the year before last, we had uh, very lucid sunsets from, from the transported smoke. But that the, the, the places that are getting the highest uh, levels of that transported smoke. And it's hard to see, but it's over 70 days per year, almost a quarter uh, of the year, are, are the, the, the bread belt, the bread basket of the United States, uh, the corn belt in, 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 the, in the Midwest, um, as well as parts of uh, the West Coast as well and, and the Southeast. And of course, uh, this is an image that many of you have probably seen. It's certainly stuck in my mind. Uh, again, just uh, making, making uh, a case that here and now things aren't coming at us one at a time, that one of the manifestations of climate change is with an increasing frequency, we have concurrent events going on at the same time. And, and, and this is just reminding us that through what I've just described, through the hurricane, through the wildfires, through the heat events, we've also been dealing with a pandemic and we've been dealing with not just the, the physical aspects of that pandemic, but the mental health aspects, the social aspects of the isolation of that pandemic. So um, all to say climate change is manifesting in the present as very stressful conditions piling up with, with the pandemic, intersecting with uh, the, the racial discrimination that has been with us for centuries but which we're perhaps more acutely aware in the last couple of years of, of how pervasive, how strong, how damaging the, the historical and systemic uh, racism and discrimination has been in this United States for many different groups of people uh, and how that sets up the health disparities that then lead to worse outcomes, whether it's the outcomes from a hurricane or the outcomes from the COVID pandemic. So that's just 
a, a, a flash. It's it's a it's a disturbing flash, and I, I hate you know it's very hard to talk about climate change and health without sharing disturbing news and disturbing forecasts. Um, but the point I want to make is when we ask what can we do today, there's a lot going on today that we need to be thinking about from a public health standpoint. And is that climate change? We don't really have a field of climate variability in public health that's as developed as we have infectious diseases or you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, health promotion. Uh, so that's where a lot of a lot of folks working on climate change and health have been. It's been it's been in the current extremes and the current variability in the neck, you know, being able to have early warning systems for next year. But this is a slide uh, that we've used for a long time. It's almost 10 years old now from, from colleagues at the, at the CDC uh, Climate and Health Program. And it lays out many, not all, but many of the different pathways. And I use this to, to highlight that uh, the timescales are, are all different. So the center of this, of this um, graphic are the four of the primary manifestations of, of the changes in our earth systems the human induced increase in, in CO2 levels along with other greenhouse gases, but CO2 levels are mentioned because they not only trap heat, but they also affect plant life very profoundly and uh, are, are, are going to are, are increasingly affecting the nutritional content of staple crops, as well as changing uh, pollen uh, allergenicity and, and pollen levels. The others are more straightforward climate change, the, the global rise in temperatures, the increase in the energy in the atmosphere and in the oceans that leads to greater extremes of weather, uh, including extreme droughts uh, and the, the rise in sea level from direct thermo expansion, as well as the melting of ice. This is what's happening in our earth. And you know, with the exception of um, you know, the heat waves and, and the, 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 the energy um, conveyed by extreme weather, um, that's affecting our natural systems uh, to to a greater extent often than 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 our than human health per se, but that next ring are all the the ways in which those primary earth changes that are playing out over seasons into years into decades are affecting um, things that humans are exposed to. So the drought and wildfires and heat com combined to cause wildfire. Uh, I'm sorry, the dr the drought and and heat combined to cause wildfires, which as I've shown, are, are affecting uh, air pollution throughout the country. The changes in, in seasons, um, earlier springs, later falls, uh, changes in you know, areas that no longer have very deep freezes in the winter are changing vector ecology, contributing, for example, to a, a spread of, of Lyme disease ticks, uh, carrying ticks into, into, North, into Canada um, through the northern United States, affecting um, the survival of mosquitoes in the southern and, and middle Atlantic states, et cetera. I mentioned the change in allergens. There's recent studies you know, confirming uh, allergenicity in peak pollen seasons, predicting these into, into coming years. Um, the lower left quadrant there is a quadrant we have struggled with uh, in terms of what can we do today to address some of these lower left quadrant issues, which are really some of the more uh, grave uh, and, and, and slower playing out threats. So one is, is the change in, in, in snowpack in many areas and glaciers uh, in areas that have depended on those glaciers for their water supplies. And so uh, as well as, as low-lying coastal areas that are um, increasingly becoming uh, 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 salinated from, from rising sea levels and intrusion of seawater into into aquifers, et cetera. There are places that are becoming less habitable. There are places that are changing dramatically in terms of their shoreline, like the northwestern coast of Alaska or you know, the vistas of snow-capped mountains. And these have profound effects on the ability of communities to stay where they are. Um, it's leading to migration in the cultural identity and, and the mental health well-being of people who are closely connected to the land, especially indigenous peoples. Um, and so these are some of the longer term aspects of climate change that our public health system also has to be thinking about. So as we think, what can we do today? There's the what's before us uh, that we can see that's happening to people right now, as well as these considerations for what is gonna happen in the future. 
And um, I won't have time to go over this in great detail. And I know I'm going to need to start speeding up because I, I, I take a little too long in the intro, but I want to share there's, there's no perfect image, but um, you know, we've talked about heat. We've talked about wildfires. We've talked about hurricanes. This is a graphic from the recent Surgeon General's report on, on the mental health well-being of young people. Uh, and I, sh I share it because I, we are in the midst of a crisis now that's fueled by many things, um, COVID being a very strong force, the isolation and the, 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 the um, anxiety associated with COVID. But this is just a graphic showing the different contributors that are coming together to affect the mental health, especially of children, young adults, adolescents. Um, and uh, notably, it's hard to see, but when we look at the environmental factors, climate change uh, and natural disasters are, are for the first time noted by the Surgeon General as being an important aspect of, uh, of, of, of the stressors that are contributing to, to this mental health crisis we're in. So just another, another piece of what's going on. But you know, I also want to look at the top box and just note again that the mental health stressors affecting children are compounded and, and there's intersectionality with the stresses that um, would, um, would accrue from, from social economic inequality, from discrimination, racism, from the migration, which is a secondary effect in many cases of, of climate stress, as well as political um, upheaval and just economic uh, opportunity. And then of course, in the bottom at the individual level, we have individual um, vulnerability factors that, that are intersecting there, ranging from race and ethnicity to, to gender and, and sexual orientation. So all of these things can be cumulative and, and intersectional in causing these health effects. And we have to think about what do we do today to be able to make those individuals resilient in the face of these compounding stressors. And this is just another depiction of this. Um, again, a slide borrowed from the from colleagues at the CDC. Uh, and I just um, share it. I'm not going to speak to it. I just spoke to it really, but but showing that that what's going on in terms of who is suffering the most from current climate variability, the, the recent Asian immigrants in the uh, um, uh, in the basements, the indigenous people in the Northwest who lost the cockles pop, the, the clams and the cockles from the heat wave that killed millions of, 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 uh, of, of uh, crustaceans and, and, and you know, seafood on the, on, on the shores that that's part of their cultural identity and part of their, their, their food. Um, that this vulnerability is grounded in the same thing that we've been talking about for decades with environmental justice, with where people are, are, are um, in many cases, uh, not given choices where they have end up living uh, for economic reasons, where things are cited in their proximity, where the investments are made in their communities, and then the root causes in, in those social forces. And I'm just gonna keep going with this and share an example, uh, again, a visual example for the, for, for the visual folks in the audience. Uh, there's been a lot of study in the last few years about the, the systematic nature of financial di discrimination that's known as redlining. It comes from the practices of something called the Homeowners Loan Corporation, which worked with the federal government to create uh, over 200 maps of urban areas in this country in the 1930s and 40s, in which neighborhoods were outlined and graded on a, on a four color scale based on their financial risk. Green being the lowest financial risk, red, yellow being, red, red being the highest and yellow the second highest. Um, and so the practice of drawing uh, lines around neighborhoods and then shading them red was called redlining. And uh, it is easily demonstrated that the areas that in the 1930s and 40s that were designated as high financial risk were disproportionately lived in by recent immigrants, by African Americans, by Hispanic Americans and other people of color. Uh, and there's a wealth of epidemiology now showing that those areas that were redlined, um, which immediate economic consequences were deprivation of low interest loans, often not able to get mortgages, um, systematic um, lack of investment in infrastructure, et cetera, that those areas are now um, found to, to have higher rates of most chronic diseases, preterm births, et cetera. Uh, and this is just a depiction of, of the city of Richmond. You can see to the Northwest, to the left there, 
that's mostly green and blue. Uh, that was the, uh, the wealthier white area. The eastern part there uh, on the right side uh, is red line. That was the predominantly African-American part of Richmond. And an analysis has been done from a climate change standpoint. So this is a map showing the, the green cover. And you can see that the left side there, the west end um, has a darker green coloring indicating more green cover. The right side has more um, impervious surfaces, which not only are heat trapping and radiating and causing higher temperatures, but also affecting runoff, wastewater uh, overflows, water quality and flooding. This is a map actually showing paved services, uh, showing the same thing, lighter color, uh, less paved services in the uh, green area, darker gray, um, more impervious surfaces in the red areas. And this translates into the average summer temperatures, which are blue cooler in the um, green lined areas and red in the red lined areas, indicating greater exposure to heat. So just one manifestation of a link between social equity climate change and health equity. So with that as a background, I'm gonna ask the audience these questions because these are the questions that we have to ask um, in terms of what can the federal government do? And you know, the federal government has tremendous resources and tremendous reach, tremendous um, financial resources, but also a lot of limitations in, in what it can do uh, in terms of climate resilience, because the actions for climate resilience are, for the most part, for the resilience part especially, not for the mitigation and reduction of greenhouse gases, but the resilience, the protecting of people, is predominantly very local, sometimes hyperlocal. And so what can the federal government do to improve the resilience and improve the capacities at the local level is, is the question. So is it about expanding research? Is that what we need to prioritize? Because there hasn't been, a, you know, a very substantial investment in research over the decades. Is it about, you know, is it all about education and training, training up and educating healthcare professionals? There's relatively low awareness right now. We need to to have all hands on deck. Should we be putting our resources in training, or is it more about focusing on children as the next generation, ensuring their resilience, building their emotional skills? Uh, building their mental health resilience. There's there's work going on in this. Is this the top priority? Is it data infrastructure? Is it the public health infrastructure and you know capturing data that we're not capturing right now in terms of uh, you know we don't really capture great data in, in a very precise way about the impacts of a lot of these disasters. We're using a lot of indirect ways of of inferring that. Is it just putting money into resilience institute? into institutions at the community level. One, one example of this are the resilience hubs that have been um, promoted by the, the, uh, the, the sustainability, um, uh, the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, the USDN, that are based in communities. They're, they're identified, developed, run by communities. Should we, is it, do we just get the money straight down to that level or, or is it really about things like the Climate and Health Program at CDC, the BRACE program that, that's funding state, uh, tribal, territorial, and, and lo um, local governments. Is it putting all of our efforts into health equity straight uh, and addressing the fundamental social determinants of health that, that you know, I've been talking about, the, 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 the natural and built infrastructure, especially as a social determinant of health, the, the quality of housing, the quality of uh, bioswales and, and green space for, for um, amelioration of, of, of flooding rains and temperature, as well as just the benefits of physical activity, the benefits of, of just living in a place that's green are all well documented. Uh, is, it, is it about putting all the energy into social determinants of health and try to lower those rates of chronic disease that make people more vulnerable? Um, what about the health care delivery system? We know one of the reasons that, that uh, hurricanes are, are associated with higher mortality, we saw this so, so tragically and starkly after Hurricane Maria, uh, is that the healthcare centers go down. We saw it in, in New York City with Langone Medi Medical Center. People lose their access. They, there's morbidity, mortality uh, among people with chronic conditions because they just can't, they're not getting dialysis, they're not getting chemotherapy, et cetera. So those are really about the health systems and enforcing their resilience. 
Is it about the human services side? Uh, and you know, we'll talk about this, what we're doing, uh, but we're with the Department of Health and Human Services and the human services side has not had a strong focus on climate change uh, within HHS uh, over the years. We're working on that. And um, there's a lot of funding that goes out through uh, this Administration for Children and Families for the Low Income Household Energy Assistance Program through Medicaid for uh, air filter, you know, air filters, portable air filters that can be installed. So is that where we should be focused? Um, or do we get to the root of the problem of climate change and devote most of our energy, most of our resources to at least working on the health sector, which is estimated to be eight and a half percent of the U.S. Uh, contributions. The U.S. health sector is estimated to be 25 percent of the global health sector uh, carbon footprint. So, so, you know, do we just, you know, I, I think all of us who work on climate change recognize that it's not an either or in terms of mitigation and adaptation that we have to mitigate all hands on deck to, to, to avoid the worst of it. But as we're seeing, we're, we're, we're experiencing it already. And, and so how do we make those trade-offs? So with that, let me tell you a little bit about the office. We were created by Executive Order 14008 in January, which gave um, HHS these three mandates. I'm going to pick up my pace a little bit. Um, we were established officially on August 30th through a press release, uh, the uh, ex expiration of a two week comment period uh, from Congress and, and a federal register notice. And uh, about 10 weeks later, uh, we were part of, of the first official government delegation from the Department of Health and Human Services pictured here, Assistant Secretary Admiral Rachel Levine joining the uh, permanent UN representative from Fiji and uh, Dr. Maria Nera of the World Health Organization announcing the COP26 health program and the US commitment to join it. And that commitment had two components of resilient health systems and low carbon health systems. So I'm answering the question there a little bit, we're doing both. And when we talk about resilient health systems, we're talking about both communities and healthcare delivery systems that we're focusing on. And uh, part of the commitments there were to do a true vulnerability and adaptation assessment. We've done great lit reviews. We've done great vulnerability and impact assessments. We're gonna be working on uh, the next step of that, which is an adaptation gap analysis, as well as a national adaptation plan for health. Uh, and in the low carbon range, we committed to coordinating the decarbonization of the federal health system um, which was subsequently mandated by a uh, second executive order in December. But also since the federal health system is only about 10% of, of, of the nation's health system, it's 90% private. We're in a very strong public-private partnership with the private health sector through the National Academy of Medicine's Action Collaborative on decarbonizing the health system. I'll come back to our th three priority areas. There's a lot on this slide and that's, Part of the good news picture, I think, um, we have a new landscape for climate change and health equity. Um, within HHS, we have a comprehensive HHS-wide climate action resilient, adaptation resilience plan. Sorry, that's a typo. Um, we have uh, both NIH and CDC uh, have embarked on, um, on, on agency-wide strategic planning, which is a wonderful development. NIH, of course, has a ton of resources and traditionally climate change and health has been the purview of just a few of them, mostly the, the, where I have come from, the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, to some degree, National Institute of Aging, Mental Health, Health, Dispar uh, health Mental Health, uh, and, and Minority Health and Health Disparities. Um, but there's a, a new framework and a, a really robust effort to engage the biggest uh, institutes like uh, infectious disease and, and heart, lung, blood, and cancer in climate change research. And the CDC, uh, which has had a, a wonderful climate and health program, uh, funding the, the BRACE programs in states and cities and, and tribes now for the last decade, CDC is now uh, embarking on a CDC-wide plan. Uh, we have the Agency for Healthcare Resources and Quality, ARC, which um, serves the, the, the clinical side of things. Uh, 
with uh, and, and health policy uh, has has embarked on uh, RFI and, and, and um, expanding its research and information resource initiatives. And of course, we have have our office. Um, and then there's there's action um, in the inter interagency space as well through the, the Global Change Research Program through these White House and State Department initiatives. And of course, the uh, investment in infrastructure that um, uh, has been passed. There's a lot that hasn't been passed, but that which has been passed is still very robust, substantial, and changing uh, the natural and built environments where, where people live. And so has tremendous potential to serve this dual role of uh, improving the thriving of communities by addressing some of this um, decades of, of degradation of, of built environments at the same time as, as building up climate resilience. And this is just a, a depiction. Um, this is uh, where the, the, the White House and the, and the Climate Task Force, uh, how they've decided to divide up the world uh, for resilience. They have five different um, resilience working groups. Uh, our office was asked to co-chair and stand up the, the working group on extreme heat. And we're very excited about progress we're making there to coordinate federal efforts and have a, a, a more robust um, uh, outreach, awareness, and, and set of resources for communities in advance of this heat season. Um, from a public health standpoint, um, I, I think of the, the slide that I showed you of, of, of CDCs, where droughts, floods, um, uh, you know, hurricanes and coasts, wildfires, and extreme heat are exposure pathways. Uh, human health cross cuts this all, so, so it's a challenge for us to be able to bring uh, the human health uh, a few people working on it. To, to, to make sure health is represented in all this, but we're doing this. And uh, this is just a, a schematic of the, the Climate Action Plan or the Climate Adaptation Resilience Plan that has uh, laid out five priority actions. Um, the, the, most, uh, uh, the one that we're most focused on, although our, our office is responsible for, uh, for, for many of these is, um, what it says here is, is improve HHS responses to the climate crisis is really a division by division walk that we've been doing to identify the existing and potential programming initiatives resources of things like you know, the uh, Administration for Community Living, which funds a lot of uh, care for the elderly and situations for the elderly in this country, the Administration for Children and Families, which um, aids families with nutrition and household energy program is housed there to identify the human services and the health system side uh, much more broadly than uh, we've been before, where it has mostly been NIH and CDC. And we also are, are working on, on uh, raising awareness and the climate literacy of, of the HHS workforce and, and other agencies as well. Uh, so these are our three priority areas. Uh, we, we divide our work along these lines one being our straight mandate of, of working on health resilience, adaptation, uh, you know, for communities, for health systems as well. Priority two is where we're recognizing this intersection between the social determinants of health and the health disparities that make people more vulnerable in the setting of a heat wave, more likely to, to have um, heart failure, respiratory failure, to need to go to an emergency room or to, or to die in the face of these added stressors. So this is where we're, we're working to um, initially within HHS, uh, and I'll describe some of what we're doing there in, in the next slide, uh, but ultimately hoping to, to, to bring that awareness to the Department of Transportation, HUD, et cetera, that are um, receiving the funds to do this, this build environment work. And then the third priority is the work focused on the health sector, both the federal and the private. And then we have the cross-cutting areas of data, indicators, analytics, communications, et cetera. So here, here's some of the areas where we have been working and, and, and making a lot of progress and, and some things that we're still working on. We have um, been convening and, and, and connecting the dots on extreme heat. We've been doing a lot of engagement um, so far, all 10 regions uh, have, have partnered with us uh, on this uh, effort to, to reach out 
to the subnational levels of government into communities themselves, community-based and faith-based organizations to assist with this adaptation gap analysis and to assist with coordinating the federal resources available um, at the state and local level. Um, all 10 regions have funding from, from the COVID money to create these health equity coalitions and councils. And most of them, we've spoken to all of them, and most of them are very eager to, to be taking on climate change and health equity as well. Uh, we're partnering and, and, and meeting with the CDC and NIH to, to coordinate uh, the, the activities you know, in the three entities. And we um, have met with uh, 13 of the divisions uh, of HHS and convening their leads. Uh, we had our first convening last February, our next in a couple of weeks to, to not just division, do the division by division walk, but to start to strategize as HHS as a whole, most of you are aware HHS is the largest grant making organization um, in the world. And priority two, a lot of what we're doing is working on existing social determinants of health initiatives. They are robust, they are embedded throughout HHS, um, and they tend to systematically ignore the natural built environments. Um, when a slide goes up with what are the social determinants of health, they almost all have natural and built environments is one of five, six, seven categories. When it comes to what's being measured, monitored and intervened in, it tends to just not be on the list and we're trying to change that. And then on the health sector side, I've mentioned most of this, um, the action collaborative, the National Academy of Medicine. We have a very uh, robust collaboration with, with CMS on um, uh, the process that they have. That's a slow process. They the, the, the conditions uh, of, of CMS reimbursement are based on a set of rules, and we have started to, uh, to, to work with them to, to alert and, and gain, yeah, gather information from the private sector through requests for information. Um, we just had a request for information in the, in the payer rule that came out a couple of months ago, uh, and we will, uh, we're looking to have that kind of language in future requests for information so that we start to understand um, the pinch points, the, the, the regulatory hurdles that may exist for, for the private health sector to take actions for resilience and decarbonization um, and ultimately support um, technical assistance that is enormous within CMS to help, help um, health sectors uh, achieve quality. And, and we, we would like for you know, resilience of the health systems and, and support for the resilience of the communities they serve to be part of that definition of quality. So I'm almost done. I wanted to share since, since of course, BU is, is a wonderful research institution, some, some thoughts, some personal thoughts about, about knowledge gaps. Um, I asked that first question, you know, do we need to be doing research? And certainly there are research gaps I would say we were building out that that epidemiology base for understanding heat. You know, we started that at, you know robustly in 1995 with the Chicago heat wave, and we've just been building on our understanding that you know elderly people, especially those who are poor, especially those who are socially socially isolated, especially those who are poor, socially isolated of color and living in in a place on an upper floor uh, of, of a urban building. You know that's a that's a real clear population. We know that rural areas, uh, in fact, have higher um, sensitivity to heat than urban populations. We know that the people who are experiencing homelessness and suffering from mental health disorders are 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 the very most vulnerable because of the medications. Um, all to say, uh, sorry, that's a little bit of a ramble, but but uh, these are some gaps that that. Uh, uh, some examples of things that I think uh, have been understudied. We we still, uh, you know, the the psychology uh, community, the, the the psychiatric community, the Association of, of the American Psychological Association, psychiatry associations, behavioral health are all really mobilizing on this in a, in a very meaningful way. Um, the evidence base is still uh, relatively under research, and I think that's a high priority. You know, understanding the link between these intersectional stressors and, and how they drive the progression of cardiovascular disease, of COPD, of anxiety, depression, et cetera, uh, is, is relatively understudied to the more acute things. And, um, 
you know, the, the intersections between uh, heat, and this is stuff that um, Dr. Rolanius has actually been, been a lead on with, with heat and air pollution, but, but other environmental toxins as well, hazardous waste site mobilization, et cetera, is an area there. But what I'd submit to you is that, and what, one of the things that I'm feeling in the role I'm playing is, is that the, the evidence based for the effectiveness of interventions is still pretty thin when it comes to protecting people um, you know, from heat is the best studied, uh, but there's a lot of cultural variability. There's a lot of geographic variability. Uh, we really need to build the evidence base and build out that implementation science for, uh, for getting people to, to take action. Um, of course, the, I, I don't have it here, but, but in, implied in this is also addressing disinformation, misinformation about climate change uh, and about, about risks. Um, the evidence base for, for that middle priority of, of addressing social determinants of health is relatively weak. This has been relatively understudied uh, at the NIH and, and, and the CDC programs have, programs that existed in, in the aughts um, didn't exist really in the teens uh, in this century. So uh, there's a gap there. And then I'd say there's a, there's a big um, biomedical uh, research gap in terms of climate change. I, I give one example there of, of kind of a tech side of, of low greenhouse gas uh, emitting imaging, diagnostic therapeutic technologies. Our technologies now tend to be very, very energy intensive and energy um, dependent. Uh, and so I think there's, there's, there's progress that could be made there. But there's a lot of systems and social science work um, on, on, on the health sector system uh, as well. So with that, um, I close and, and hopefully we have some time for, for conversation uh, and I'll just close with these three points. Um, I hope I've made it clear that, um, you know, climate change is compounding decades of, of, of social uh, degradation of social determinants of health. Uh, and that if we wanna look to where people are suffering now, we look to where that discrimination has been taking place. And I'd say, uh, and we can discuss this, we have to bring climate thinking and long-term thinking to the investments we made, we make, um, but for a variety of reasons, not the least of which being addressing the suffering that's happening now, we also have to be grounded in the present. And this is the work that we're, we're, we're um, trying to make happen from, from the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity. So thank you very much. Um, I would point you all, oh my gosh, I'm cut off. I don't know how that happened, but visit us at hhs.gov slash OCHI and, and please um, sign up for our, our, our listserv. We are putting out regular uh, an announcements and uh, we'll have something uh, exciting coming up within uh, the next couple of months as we start to uh, start a series of seasonal forecasts for health. Keep your eyes on that. And with that, back to you, Dr. Wallinis. Thank you so much, Dr. Balbus. That was just fantastic. Gave us so much to think about. Uh, we're a little short on time, so we won't have as much time for questions as, uh, as, as we would like, but uh, I, I do wanna make sure that we end on a note of hope. And so from your perspective, can you give us uh, uh, the your perspective on on hope on on whether you know we can make progress the progress sufficient uh, to uh, minimize or or avert the worst of the disasters. Tell tell us why you get up every day uh, with with hope that we can make a difference. So um, I do have a message of hope um, uh, while acknowledging that we're in an exceedingly tough time right now. Um, and you know, addressing the fact that um, you know we we have to double down in terms of our communications and talking. You know, Catherine Hayhoe is 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 so eloquent in saying how we have to keep talking about climate change even as we're dealing with very frightening and and traumatic uh, events, including the war that's taking place in the Ukraine, including. Uh, the COVID pandemic, where the headlines now are talking about the possibility of a second wave. But what gives me hope and, and what, what I hope uh, uh, everybody sees is the extremely powerful role of leadership, of truth-telling, of a science and evidence-based approach to governing that we see in the Biden administration, where the signaling and, and the 
uh, addressing uh, you know, needs, neglected needs in climate change um, that have occurred over decades uh, through executive orders has really mobilized the federal government in a way. So what gives me hope is that I see every day, everybody that I sit down with um, across the federal agencies is A, just been waiting for this opportunity to act and B, um, you know, looking for the support guidance and, and vision um, from, from those of us who have been working on this for a while. So there's tremendous motivation, there's tremendous potential for, for really powerful action. Um, I hope you'll see it. Um, I, no, I, I won't say I hope you'll see it. Watch the space because you will see it. Um, we, we are still up against formidable political challenges and we, we, we need to be clear-eyed about, about what we can do today because we have an opportunity today. I wake up every day asking that question because I know that the number of days that I have uh, to, 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 uh, to, to be running um, could very well be very limited. So um, not, the, not the brightest light, but, but that is the hope is, 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 is that we have the leadership that sees things clearly, that strikes the vision and that empowers uh, you know, what is the majority of this country that recognizes that this is something we need to deal with urgently, transformatively, and, and comprehensively. Wonderful, thank you. We'll leave it there for this session. Uh, please join us back at 10 a.m. Eastern time, so in about eight minutes for uh, a wonderful panel spanning uh, 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 guests uh, from the community level uh, uh, to uh, experts in this area. So please join us back in about seven or eight minutes. Dr. Balbus, thank you so much.